In this video, you learn the whole project planning process step by step. You can plan anything using this process, but I want to warn you from the start. A gun chart or a project schedule is not a project plan. We'll talk about the professional project planning process. So, let's dive in. It all starts with a project chart. I believe there is no way to create an efficient plan without a project chart, or at least without collecting the major information that it requires, like objective, business case, and boundaries of the project. I have a separate video on project chart, I'll leave you a link in the description. Ok, project planning process is structured, you can do it step by step, but it's also an iterative process, so sometimes you need to go back and cycle through the processes and information you discovered once again. I'll explain the major points where you need to reassess your project plan. Step number one is to determine how will you plan the project. It's kind of meta knowledge, I know. You need to watch this video and other videos to get a bigger picture of the project planning process. And then you can get back to thinking about how you will plan the project, what steps you'll use to the full extent, what processes will you omit. But you don't skip any of the steps that I described below. Step number two is to collect available templates, learn about processes and policies in the organization. First of all, you don't want to invent a wheel. Second, you don't work in a vacuum. The goal of this step is to ensure that you won't create unnecessary traction between your project and the organization that you work in. It simplifies your life. Step number three is to outline the project management plan contents. I am totally okay if you don't write a formal document, but I do recommend to outline some processes or workflows, and you do need to do it right at the beginning. Again, think about all the steps from this video and think in broader terms of all 10 knowledge domains of project management. Step number four is to identify key project stakeholders. You'll have your clients and customers, you'll have your leadership, you'll have subject matter experts and so on. You need to perform the initial stakeholder analysis to start specifying requirements. If you work in one organization for several years, then most likely you already know your key internal stakeholders. Step number five is to determine detailed requirements. Ideally, you start with the high-level requirements from the project charter, and you start to decompose and specify these requirements. Based on that, you collect more requirements from the main stakeholders. It may include sketches, designs, requirements, specifications, performance, safety and reliability characteristics. So, what's more important, you collect requirements not only related to the product features, but also requirements to project management and quality requirements and so on. The goal is obvious, you need to collect requirements that describe the product or service you need to create and how you need to create it. Step number six is to identify quality standards. It's a part of requirements identification, but I want you to remember it as a separate step. Quality should be an integral part of your project, not something that you want to achieve at the end of the project. Quality standards and characteristics that you need to meet are a part of the scope of work. So you need to identify what you need to do to produce a quality product or service in the first place. Moreover, you need to be clear on how you will verify that it is of the required quality. In other words, how will you test it? The goal is to make quality a part of your implementation process. Step number seven is to create the project scope statement. It's a document that explains to your clients and sponsors what needs to be done on a project to achieve its goal. I have an in-depth video on project scope statement, I'll leave you a link in the description. It's one of the crucial steps that can make or break your project. The goal is to get approval from clients on the work you are going to plan in the details. If you enjoyed the video so far, give it a thumbs up right now. I'll wait a bit here before we move on. Do it right now. Thank you in advance. Ok, step number eight is to determine project management team. As a project manager, you should not proceed with planning on your own. 
Yes, you'll get some people from the start, some internal stakeholders might help you, but you do need a project management team with enough technical expertise to continue. You'll need to acquire subject matter experts that will help you to break down the project further. Step 9 is to assess what you need to buy or outsource. Sometimes it's cheaper to outsource some parts of the project to a third party. You need to think through things that your organization and your team are not proficient in. This way you won't waste efforts and resources, and it will ensure that you will focus on searching for experienced vendors rather than diving deep into the problem yourself. Step number 10 is a must. You need to create a work breakdown structure, or WBS. I believe a WBS is a must have on any project, big or small, agile or plan driven. The goal is to break down the project into smaller, tangible pieces that you can easily manage. Moreover, you want to identify 100% of such pieces. I also have an in-depth guide on work breakdown structure, I'll leave you a link in the description. Step number 11 is to create a list of activities. Once you finish the work breakdown structure from the previous step, you can take its elements and break down them into the tasks. These are the actual tasks that the project team will perform. When you break down all your lowest level elements of your WBS, you'll get this list of activities. For sure, you need to follow some specific rules and guidelines to do it correctly, so do read the article on the work breakdown structure I mentioned above. One important note here, activities have a lot of properties or attributes, for example, estimates of time and cost, assigned resources, dependencies, risks, and so on. So in essence, an activity contains all the information about the work a team member needs to perform. So in future planning steps, you'll fill in all this information into each activity. Step number 12 is to create a network diagram. And I understand that nowadays no one creates a standalone network diagram. Project management software that you use most likely does it for you when you create a WBS and identify dependencies and sequence of activities. Nevertheless, the goal of this step is to put all activities into a sequence and identify dependencies between them. Keep in mind that even if there are no hard dependencies, I do recommend you assign discretionary dependencies. It will help you to create a logical flow of the project work. By the way, the sponsor of this video is my free career change cheat sheet for project managers. It's challenging and overwhelming to get your first project management role, and this cheat sheet gives you a proven action plan to get promotion to a project manager in the nearest future. If you want to become a project manager, you need to get a copy. Link is in the description. <laughs> step number 13 is to estimate required resources. This step might seem counterintuitive if you start a project with a full team already available, but many projects start with only a PM and some part-time resources available. In this case, you need to take each activity or task from the list and think through the kind of material, equipment and people you need to finish this task. So you ask yourself, do I need a 2-ton truck or 5-ton truck? Do I need a front-end developer or back-end developer? What level do I need? Senior because of the complexity of the requirements, or maybe a cheap junior developer will handle it. The next step is to estimate duration and cost. So now you know the type and level of experts you need to perform all the tasks. Ideally, they should estimate how long it will take for them to finish the work. But if you don't have these people on the project yet, you can make an estimate for an average performance level for an average expert of that level. Again, don't do it alone, a subject matter expert should help you. Step number 15 is to determine the critical path. A critical path is the longest in duration path through the sequence of activities. You need to know the critical path because the tasks on it require a lot of attention from your side. All the delays on the critical path impact the project milestones directly. Step number 16 is to develop a project schedule. 
Yes, you waited long enough. That's where you create your shiny gun chart. But you, as a project manager, you are interested not in those colored bars, but in start and end dates for each activity. You don't care whether a bar is 53% colored. You want to know whether an activity started and ended on the dates that you specified. The rest are vanity metrics. At this step you might discover that you are way beyond project deadline, so you might need to get back, negotiate some changes to the scope or their deadline, and make another iteration of planning. Step number 17 is to develop a project budget. As you might have guessed, I've got you covered on this one as well. I've got a video on how to create an accurate project budget. I'll leave you a link in the description. By the way, that's another sanity check here. You may find out that you don't fit into the budget constraints, so you need to discuss this with clients. Step 18. Determine all roles and responsibilities. You don't want to lead the project on your own. Delegate responsibilities to your senior level team members. You can create a responsibility assignment matrix or RACI chart. You can assign responsibilities for different deliverables. Or likewise, you can describe daily responsibilities for different expert groups in your team. Believe me, it's a long-term investment and it's worth it. Step 19 is to plan project communications. On a small project, you don't need to think too much about it, but at the very least ensure that you are copied in all important emails and that from time to time you do check if there are bottlenecks in the communication. I have an article on this one as well. Step 20. Plan stakeholder engagement. Now this one is crucial. You need to think hard about how to make stakeholders, mostly that are beyond your project team, to help you with your project. You need to think how to keep people informed and engaged in the things that happen on your project. They should not tune out from it for far too long, especially your clients and sponsors. I'll leave you some links on this topic as well in the description. Step 21 is to perform risk management. Without risk management, your plan will not be able to stand the tide of small and big problems. It will become useless in no time and you'll have to make constant changes. All your efforts to avoid and mitigate risks should be a part of your project scope, budget and schedule baselines. I do recommend you that you invest time into risk management. And you know the drill already, I've got you covered, I'll leave you the links on risk management below this video. Step 22 is to validate your plan. After performing risk management, it's the major point where you need to iterate through your plan. It means that now you need to get back to the beginning and validate that your plan is still realistic and you are within constraints. Step 23. Create baselines. So, once you've validated your project plan and it feels like it's a realistic one, you need to fix this version as your baseline. There are three main baselines. Scope, cost and schedule baselines. And the baseline is just a certain version of your scope, budget and schedule. You'll track the progress of your project against these baselines. It will help you understand when you get that much off the initial plan so that you need to make adjustments to the plan. But you don't change them when something small happens. What's more important, to make a change to a baseline, you'll need to have a formal change request and approval from your clients and sponsors. In step 24, you need to plan ways to measure performance. From one side, don't overcomplicate it. From the other, think how to collect daily performance data and how to create weekly progress reports. It's important that you can compare this information with the information in baselines. And you want this process as seamless as possible. But in reality, it's often complicated and involves lots of nasty spreadsheets. Step 25 is to create a change management plan. And that's the only subsidiary plan I recommend you to formalize and ensure that clients know about it and understand. You need to educate them that there are no small changes and 
any change has an impact in many different aspects of the project. With step 26, you need to create a rewards and recognition system. Here's the truth. Inexperienced project managers don't think about motivation or do it on the go. But professional PMs think about rewards, recognition and motivation in advance. So think about the ways you can motivate your team. Also, quite often you need to plan some budget for team building activities. The next step, 27. You need to finalize subsidiary plans and create a final draft of the project management plan. So yes, you might not have a full formal document for that. But in any case, collect and finalize everything that you need to manage this project. At the very least, you need to brush out the baselines and write out the main processes. Because in the next step, you'll show your plan to your clients. So step number 28 is to gain formal approval for the plan. Again, professional project managers ensure that it's just a formality. And for sure, you don't want to show your plan for the first time this far in the process. You need to keep your main stakeholders engaged in the whole process. They do need to share ownership for the plan, otherwise it will be a difficult project for you. The last step is to present your plan to the whole team. And in most cases, your team doesn't participate in all project planning processes. Team and group leaders do the bulk of the work, and moreover, no one of them, except you, has the bigger picture of the whole project management process. So here you do share the greater scheme. Again, your goal is to create a feeling of ownership for the project in general. Here you have it, the whole project planning process. The good thing about thinking through all these steps and documenting the main points is that it's all reusable. You can use them in any other company you're working with just small adjustments. So it's worth your efforts. Moreover, it helps you systemize your knowledge and your project management approach. I left you lots of links in the description that can help you thought. Do check them out. Also, if you want to become a project manager, get your copy of the career change cheat sheet. And let's stay connected. So subscribe if you haven't already and give me a thumbs up for this video. I'll see you next time.